Well, I'm Mel Pliner, World War II glider pilot. I flew five missions during World War II, four combat, and one was a, an abort. Uh, I got into the service in March of 1941 after having made a trip down to Buenos Aires, South America, on a Ford Motor ship when I was 17 as an officer's mess boy <clears throat> down to Buenos Aires, Argentina, uh, across the equator, and I was initiated into the David Jones lockers. And uh, when I get, came back, I enlisted into the Citizens Military Training Corps, which is uh, CMTC, where I could get out of the city for two weeks during the hot months of June or July, August. I went upstate, uh, upstate New York to uh, Twin Rivers, where there was a military base where they trained us in field artillery. And we stayed up there for two weeks. I did that three years in a row. I was at 70, I mean, I was 37, 38, and 39 at the time. When the draft started, I knew that when I was drafted, they'd have a record of my training in the field artillery, and I didn't particularly want to go into the field artillery. And having made a trip to Buenos Aires on a board motor ship, East Indian, I had three meals a day, and I had clean sheets in my bunk, so I figured, well, I'll join the Navy. So I went up to the Navy enlistment and asked the officer there in, in charge, I said, how long is your enlistment? And he said, six years. And I said, well, that's, I thought to myself, that's too long. So I went across the hall, and this is downtown Manhattan, 39 Whitehall Street. I can remember that. And uh, I went into the U.S. Army uh, Air Corps at the time, and I asked him, how long is your enlistment? And he said, duration and six months. I said, sign me up. And that's how I got into the service. And this was in March of 1941. They sent me over to Fort Dix, New Jersey, where I got my uniform and got a place in the barracks. They taught us how to march and how to carry a rifle, which already I had known how to do in my CMTC training. I decided to transfer over to a material squadron fixing airplanes. I was pretty handy with my hands. And so I transferred over to the 82nd Materiel Squadron on base, fixing airplanes. And it wasn't for very long, the next, the next year, that was in 1940, 1942, this 82nd Materiel Squadron was getting ready to transfer to a base in North Africa, getting ready for the invasion of Sicily, and the commander in charge of the, of the group came to a couple of us guys and said, we, we're leaving you guys behind to start a new organization with the draftees that are coming in, and you, you guys know, this, know the way, and uh, so you can start a new, new squadron. I figured, well, if I couldn't go with my outfit, I'll find my own way. So I went over to the uh, officers flight training to try and sign up to learn how to fly an airplane. He said, we got a list as long as your arm. I said, okay. I went over to the officers candidate school. I figured, well, I'll see if I can sign up and go to an officer school. He said, we got a list longer than your arm. I said, well, okay. So I started back to the flight school. And when I got down there, they had just received a telegram, a, what they call a Twix telegram, looking for volunteers for the glider program. I said, sign me up. And that's how I got into the glider program. August of 1942, I remember that. Once we landed, we were ground troops. Uh, no more glider pilot, because we weren't flying the gliders. We, we had to learn how to dig a foxhole or throw a grenade, shoot a rifle, which we, which we knew how to do. So we got ready to, to do that. After we graduated that, 
this, the outfit that I, I was with was sent to Alliance, Nebraska, where there they were forming the 436 Two Carrier Group, which consisted of the 79th, 80th, 81st, and 82nd Squadron, which I was in, and headquarters. And of course, before we become a, a, a group, we have to have the, the power pilots, the truck drivers, the cooks and the bakers, all the rest of the crew that made up the 436 troop carrier group. When all the troops arrived, we were then sent to Lorenberg Maxton, North Carolina, for transition training. The thing is that the pilots that were assigned to our outfit had never towed a glider before. They just graduated their school learning how to fly the C-47s. So we went into more transition training, learning how to be towed, how to, the power pilots towed the gliders, and we got more landings. That was the important thing, the landings. After the pilots got their training towing the gliders, then uh, the, the, the troops that we were going to carry in combat started to come on board base to learn how to load their troops, how to load a jeep, and a howitzer, and that sort of thing, so that when we got over into the area for combat, they were able to, to do that. After we finished transition training, then the C-47s and their pilot, co-pilot, engineers, uh, crew chief, and so forth, they flew off to England, and we got on a Queen Mary, five, 4,000 other guys besides myself on the Queen Mary, and we went over to England. It took us four and a half days to zigzag across the, across the Atlantic to avoid submarines, and it was a pretty fast ship. When we got there, we were assigned to uh, air base at Membury, England, a little, little town of Membury, I remember that. And uh, we went into more training. And while we were there, they brought on our base an English horse, a couple of English horse gliders. Now, I explained that the CG-4 Comac like America made was 3,750 pounds. Now, the English horse was 7,500 pounds empty and could carry a load equivalent to its base, which was another 7,500. So you're looking now at a, at a 15 ton airplane. Okay, that's load, full load, airplane weight and a full load. Whereas C-47s could tow two CG-4A American glides could only tow one English horse, it weighed twice as much, could carry twice the load. I got about two hours of training and flying it. And the thing is, you know, if you can fly one glider, you can fly there, just like if you own a Ford automobile and somebody says, hey, can you bring me my car? It's a Chevrolet or whatever it is. There's no problem. You get in there, find out ignition switch and sh shifting and so forth. It's the same thing flying the gliders, flying an airplane, same, pretty much the same thing. Well, after a period of time, I noticed that they put some barbed wire around the base, had an M an MP standing around, I figured, well, something must be up. And it was getting pretty close to the 6th of June. Well, the troops that we were going to carry in the combat, the paratroopers and, and the troopers that we were going to carry coming on base, I figured something must be up. Well, actually, Eisenhower had chosen the 4th of June for D-Day, but his uh, weather group said, Lieutenant Colonel, or Colonel Eisenhower, there's going to be some bad weather on the 4th, but he says it's going to clear on the 6th. He says, okay, we go on the 6th. And that's how D-Day became the 6th. Originally, it was going to be the fourth, but the weather was was not good for for the invasion. But the sixth was so. Now the sixth of June became D Day, 1944. Well, when we our group 
glider pilots and power pilots were all in, in the assembly room and we were assigned our gliders and I was assigned an English horse glider on, and I went in on D plus one on the 7th. On the 6th of June was a night mission and we, and we lost a lot of glider pilots because there was no moon, it was dark, and they were being towed across the channel into, into France. And when they cut loose, very few of them made real good landings and clear, but, but a lot of them lost their lives and what they were carrying, going into trees and, and hedgerows and stuff like that. And I was thankful that even though I had to fly an English horse glider, I was going in on daylight where I could see the field to pick a field that I was going to land in. Well, got up the next morning on the 7th and I got the, the horse glider. It was stationed on the en very end of a 5,000 foot runway with the tail section over the grass at the end of the, of the concrete. And I had, uh, I think I had 23, normal load is 26, I had 23 troops in it. And the guys in the, in the gliders ahead of me, if they felt they had a, one man too many, go to the last glider, he's got room for you. Well, I wound up with 33 troops. Now I'm overloaded and I can't send them back to anybody. I can, I can either, I can, I can just cancel my flight because I'm overloaded, which would have been no problem. Anyway, when it came time to take off, off we went. Now, the horse glider does, doesn't have hydraulic pedals. It has air-operated brakes and flaps. And there's a little tank right behind the pilot's left elbow there, a little rock tank with 100 pounds air pressure. And enough to pressure to operate the brakes and the flaps maybe once or twice. After that, no more air pressure, no brakes, no flaps. Okay, so here we go down the runway. Now normally the glider is off the runway before the tow ship. But my tow ship, we're about halfway down the runway and he's off geared up and I'm still on the runway. I drop half flaps and I managed to get up behind the glider, behind the tow ship and we caught up to the rest of the formation over the channel at a thousand feet high. Okay, here we go across the channel and we hit the coast of France and we get, you know, there's an astrodome, a plastic astrodome uh, just past the pilot's compartment on the top of the C-47 and the crew chief gets up there with the, all, what they call an Aldous lamp and it can either give you a green light or a red light. Now the green light means get ready to take off to cut loose and the red light means we're over the landing zone cut loose. Well daylight time about seven o'clock in the morning we cross the channel cross the, the coastline of, of France. I get the green light to get ready and I could look down and I could see the little town of St. Mary and Gleese right down there. And after we pass that, I get the red light and I reach up and I, I cut loose and I make a turn to the right there. And here in front of me is a nice big field. There's some cattle down in the beginning, but I don't see any dead ones, so there's no mines. I make a, t a high, nose high slip and I come in there after I drop half flaps and I set the air brakes and I made a good tricycle landing but I noticed that I'm sliding on wet grass and I'm still doing about 85 miles an hour so I pull back on the wheel as far as I can and then I jabbed it forward well the lieutenant in charge of the troops was standing there in the compartment and looking like that I said lieutenant you better sit down he said don't worry about me I said okay well, when I jabbed it forward like that, now the CG4A is, is combat glider is steel tubing covered with fabric, whereas the English horse glider is all plywood, made of all wood. 
Well, when I pulled the stick back, the wheel back, and jabbed it forward, the, the nose wheel came up through the through the floor and got the lieutenant right in the crotch, and he fell back. I don't think he ever had any kids after that. But anyway, when I pulled back and pushed it down and broke, the, I broke the back of this of this hot English wooden glider, and when I did that, it dug into the ground, and that's helped me stop stop the glider. When I finally came to the stop, my right wing was right over the hedgerow. Well, normally you could open the door, but having broken the back, we couldn't open the door, so we had to take the ax off the, off the firewall and chop the door open. And all my troops got out and they carried the lieutenant out. And any landing you could walk away from was a good landing, and that was a good landing, even though I wrecked the, the horse and glider. I made my way back to the coast, and they told us to get back as quickly as they can because they had the C-40s again hooked up to more gliders, but they didn't have glider pallets to fly a resupply mission with ammo and gas and whatever. And about at that time, the seaborne forces had come up and overrun the, the Germans, and we didn't have to fly the resupply mission. And that was my Normandy mission. After a while, that was in June. In August, about 12 of us were in a C-54, and we took off at Land's End, England, and flew down out over the ocean, around, around Italy and uh, Portugal and to a, to an air base in on North Africa where the C-54 refueled, and we f they flew us up to a little airstrip they had carved out of the area there, close to the town of Sirovizia on the coast of Italy, and that was going to be our our base for the Southern France invasion, and they had brought in. C, uh, CG4A gliders and the troops that we were going to carry in. And on the Southern France invasion, I, I was assigned a, a CG4A glider and it had a 75 millimeter howitzer in it. During that time, they, now they, they had carved this airstrip, it was a dirt strip, and down below was the tent area, just below the, the airstrip. We were signed cots at the time. And one night when we were asleep, we had a good heavy rain, and the rain washed off the airstrip down into the tent area, and the water was just, just licking my butt on the cot, and my B4 bag was floating. And of course, everything was shut down. Nothing was loose. It's mud all over the place. And we were all walking around in barefoot. Because there was no point in putting on shoes and socks in the mud. After about three or four or five days, sun came out, and everything dried out, and all you could see was just footprints in the mud. <laughs> well, after that dried up, we, we got squared away and got ready for, for our mission. And uh, so we got in the troops and, and my howitzer and three men with, I don't know, 10 or 15 rounds of ammunition. Uh, we took off and I get in the formation of echelon of four threads, one, two, three, four, single C-47s towing single gliders. After we get into formation, we're up at about a thousand foot ele elevation and we're heading heading north to the, to the coast of France. I noticed out in front there that formation makes it turn to the right. Here are all the flights turn to the right. And then they're heading another 15 minutes and they're, they're heading back south. And I said, well, it must have been canceled the mission. And when they get down another 15 minutes, take another 15 minutes. What they were doing was a box turn 15 minutes to each reason being the ending we were supposed to land in was fog, couldn't see it. 
So they're waiting for the sun to come out to burn the sucker, the fog off. After the box train wasting an hour, we headed back up north to the east to the coast of France. We got in there. Now, they had done some reconnaissance work and just north and east of St. Mary Gleese, there was a forest in the, fang, in, the, in the shape of the letter C. And they told us, now if you see that, that's the area where we want you guys to land the gliders. Because it's behind enemy lines, because they were watching the coast. And that's where we want you to bring the troops in and the howitzers and all the rest of that stuff to cut off their supplies, which we did. Okay, here's the big letter C. Here's the little town of Lemoy, L-E-M-U-Y. Get the green light, and then pretty sure I get the red light. Now, that part of southern France is white grape, grape country. They grow grapes for wine. And they have wire lines on posts, and the grape vines are wrapped on the wires. And that's, they grow grapes. Why did they did harvest the grapes off to make the wine? Well, I came in on top of this. I mean, as I did, I just knocked them all down and it just took the fabric off the bottom of my clock. I could see the grapevines, but I made a good landing. When I did that, off about 100 yards, there was a little house there, two-story house. The bottom floor had three windows with the shutters all closed. The second floor, the end window shutters were closed, but the center it was dark and we saw a rifle fire. There was some crowds back against the back wall. They could see out the, the window, but we couldn't see them. All we could see is the flash from their rifles. <laughs> Shortly after that, another glider came in alongside of me, just a little bit forward, with 13 troops. And they started to draw the fire. And they got out and come over on my side, where we were, eating grapes, hot, dusty, grapes for a little juice. So I said, one of the lieutenant said, the, not the lieutenant, but the sergeant in charge of the fire, of the howitzer said, Lieutenant, we've got a bigger gun than they do, why don't we do that? I said, okay, you troops just aim at the center window and keep the troops back there. We'll open the nose of my glider, get the howitzer out. The sergeant in charge opens a breach, bore sights it to the house, puts a round in there and he's holding the lanyard and out come three krauts. They saw the rifle, the howitzer. <laughs> if we'd have fired around, we'd have just blown them right out. <laughs> that was it. So they saw the howitzer. They came out and gave up. All the troops now took over the prisoners. Okay, things quieted down. And the rest of the troops took the krauts and they were gone. And the three guys with my house, they stayed right there. Well, there was a, 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 a house in, in the area there uh, that the troops had taken over for headquarters. So I started walking down the road. Dogs are doing something, I don't know. I started walking down the road towards the farmhouse where they had made headquarters. And along the way, I, I come across a Fiat automobile in the ditch. And I look in there, it's keys in condition, but I figure, oh, booby trap. So I go out to the field where the paratroopers had jumped in the morning, took my knife and I cut some shroud lines. I come back, tie around the handle on the door and get around the back and I pull it, open the door, cut open, cut out, but nothing goes off. No booby trap. So I get in and look around and I didn't see anything. The key's in the ignition. I get in there and I start it up. I can't get out of the ditch though. That's why it was in there. And shortly after that, a couple of GIs and a Jeep come by. I stop that and I say, hey, get me out of here. No problem, they hook up a 
chain and pull me out. And I said, now if you guys really give me a, some gas out of your gas can. Well, he said, I don't know. I said, well, I've got a gallon. Got up there and started the engine. I look at the gas gate, half a tank. Well, that thing ought to, ought to get pretty good mileage for a little car like that. So he drives off and I get in there. And, I, and the, the little cars like that were like our cars where you, you come around the back and open the door for the trunk. In this car, you had to fo fold forward the, the back of the back seat. And that's the little storage compartment. And then there was a case of French wine. Close that up. I drive up there and I, I checked in, told him where my howitzer was and that I had this little Fiat automobile. He said, think that'll tow a howitzer? I said, there's only one way to find out. He says, okay, go back to get your howitzer and bring it up here with the three men. So I go back down there. We had to cut some wires to get back in there because I, I left it in the middle of the, of the field. And these guys are just standing around just eating grapes. I says, okay, guys, we've got to hook that howitzer up to my car and take it back to headquarters. So we hooked it up with some wire that we took off the, <laughs> the grapes like that. And in the sand, we got it back up on the road and the guys got in the car. We drove back up to headquarters towing this 75 millimeter howitzer. <laughs> and I, I just left it there. And I went over to where the couple of three, four GIs were and they had something cooking. I don't know how they did that, but I had a pot and I says, what's cooking? He says, what you got to put in it? I says, come here, I'll show you. I showed him that case of French wine. He says, you're in. But whatever it was, it was better than eating K rations. Because we carried K ration with us. If we landed somewhere and we were there for a day or two, K rations was better than nothing. But this was better than K rations. So after that, we finished that case of wine and we got smashed, slept out. The next morning we got up and I said, let's go in the town of Lemoy and see what's going on in there. So three other guys, myself, we get in, take our rifles off lost, and we drive. Now the town of Lemoy is laid out like a wagon wheel. The hub is the church with its steeple and so forth. And then the streets are like spokes of a wheel. Of course, there's streets between that go over the street, but it's, it's, so we drive in and we get within about maybe 100 feet, 150 feet, and we start to draw rifle fire. I stop the, stop the car, we get out into the doorways. And I said, tell you what, guys, let's start shooting at the bell in the tower. Bing, 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 and after about three or four or five minutes, the crowd's in there come out and they give up. The town comes alive now and they're going to kill the suckers. I said, no, I said, they're prisoners of war. About that time, the troops coming up from the shoreline come into town and they take over the crowd. So I said, well, we got to get back to base because they've got a couple more gliders that for resupply. Go back to where we left our gear, got to car and drove down to the coast, about 20, 25 miles. We get down there and I see a swabby and I said, who's in charge down here? He said, you go to see uh, Lieutenant So-and-so. I drive up to Lieutenant So-and-so. I said, look, Lieutenant, if you get us on the next boat over to the island where the C-47s were waiting for it to take us back to base, you can have this car. He says, you see little cars and trucks along the, the firewall there? They're all mine. <laughs> I wasn't the only one that came down and gave the truck. Well, we got a boat ride over to the island. We got in the C-47 with the rest of the guys, and we flew back to base. Got back to base. They didn't need a resupply because the shore troops had made it up. So we all got, when we, when we all got back together, got in the the C-54 uh, and drew us back to England. And that was the Southern France invasion. It wasn't long after that, that in September, they decided to fly 
market garden, which was the Holland mission. And this time, I decided to see a CG4A with a Jeep and three men. So we take off, and I think it was around the 18th of September, if I remember. And we get in the formation a thousand feet above sea level, and we start to cross the channel, and we run into so dense fog, I can't see the tow ship in front of me. All I can see is the, about a couple of feet of the tow line from my glider going to the tow ship. And the formation just goes to pieces, every man for himself. Well, the pilot that's flying the C-47 is towing me. He starts down. I can't see it, but I can see the tow line. Normally, the tow line, I'm like that. Tow line, he's like that. I got to follow him down. And we break out of the fog at about 50 feet above sea level. I mean, hell, <laughs> I, I think my wheels were, f but they weren't. No, I, I was above the, above the water. Well, anyway, turn around, we fly back to base. Get back to base, cut loose, go into land. We had two gliders that flew, hit each other. One of the guys was in our squadron. Boy, remember his name was Boyd, B-O-Y-D, and he was in our barracks. Well, a couple of days later, they reaffirmed the, the flight, and we get in and fly. Coast is clear. We get into car, into Holland, and we get the red, green light, the red light, cut loose, and I make a landing close to Nijmegen, the town of Nijmegen. Come in and land, made a good landing. Open those, Jeep came out, drive up to headquarters, check in there. And uh, by that time, a couple of three other guys in my squadron were there standing around. And uh, there's nothing more for us to do. So we decided to go into town and go to this hotel metropole in the town of Brussels. Famous hotel metropole. And we're kind of hot and dirty and thirsty. We think we'll get cleaned up and maybe uh, do some sightseeing and maybe hit a bar or two. So, so we go to this hotel metropole, the four of us. We'll go up to the counters and we'd like a room. Sorry, monsieur, but there's no rooms. Place is deserted. We'll fall back here, go back up to the counter, put our rifles up on the counter and says, we want a room and we'll pay for it and we got a room. So we go up to the room and strip down and I need to use the bathroom, the toilet, but one of the guys is sitting on the toilet, but here's another toilet. So I sit down and I do what I have to do. When I flush, I got the surprise of my life. It's a bidet. <laughs> well, you live and learn. Anyway, got cleaned up, got dressed, and hit the bars a couple of times, and then we decided, hell, we'll make our way back to our base. And we did, got a ride across over to England and back to Membury, which is, all, which is the base we took off at. And we were there for a while, and then uh, the following year, in 1944, we were transferred over to an airstrip a-55 near the town of Fontainebleau, famous church Fontainebleau. And we do some more training there. And when we get assigned our glider, I had 15 troops, I mean 13 troops. And I had a washed out cadet as a co-pilot. But here on the base, off in the side, was a wrecked B-26. And I went in there and I scrounged off some flak plate and I put some under my seat and under my feet in my glider. It came time to take off and we get into formation. Now before that we're, we're sitting there on line waiting and one of the troops fires around. I got up to see 
he, he, all the guys were holding their rifles like that, and this guy was fidgeting and fired around up to the top, and I got up to see if he'd cut any of my control tables. Well, evidently he did. I told the rest of the troops, put your rifles on safety. So we didn't have any more of that. Got into formation, and uh, when we get over the, the Rhine River to the little town of Wiesel, we get the green light and get the red light, and here I make my turn, and here's a great big field with big power lines going across it. Gliders in there, some of them had hit the wires. And I see a good place and I come in there and I'm flying, I'm flying my glider like this. Got armor plate under my ass, under my feet. My co-pilot's sitting here, 13 troops in the back. And the co-pilot has never been in combat before. Got two hours flight time in a glider and he's froze stiff because flak is all over the place. And I'm sitting there like this, and I'm about 200 feet high, and some crowd's a bird shooter. Because most of the troops, is, they're aiming for the glider, and it's all going through the tail section. This guy's a bird shooter. You know how you lead a bird? Well, he got me right through the right forearm, right between the radius and the ulna. And my arm went into shock and I yelled over to my co-pilot, take over, I'm hit. Well, this guy is froze. So I pulled up the spoiler, held it with my left foot, and I landed my glider with my left hand and my right foot. When I came and landed, I took the right gear off, came to a stop with my wing down like that. All my troops got out, and he came alive, got out, and came, got out of the, the, the wing. Sun, sunshine's weird under the wing in the shade. I, he says, let's get up. I said, well, you wouldn't run 15 feet. The guy would shoot you down. Said, We're safe down here. Spurt, spurt, spurt. We get out my first aid kit and started wrapping around. We're there maybe the better part of an hour. Finally, things start to quiet down a little bit. And here goes a squad of American troops across the field. I said, now's the time to get up and run and get in with them. And we did. This video was brought to you by the Mid America Flight Museum and Victor Premium Dog Food. Hi, I'm Eric Johnston. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment below, and subscribe to my channel to enjoy many more aviation videos to come.